Have you ever thought about the phrase that we often say in church? Usually, usually on Sundays where we where we come to uh, to the table or where there's a baptism, we do this thing in churches that we call the creed. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's sung. It's but the the basic premise of it is this: is the the recitation of words that have been handed down to the church through not just centuries or decades, but millennia. This phrase, this this. Um, statement of belief that we call, particularly the Apostles' Creed, is one of the earliest formulations of of a summation of of doctrine and dogma. These sort of tenets that the, that would be not just the the um, not just the the boundary marker for where, where where Christianity kind of sits, but they would be the foundation of what catechesis would look like, of what discipleship looked like, of what training and and a reminding of people looked like throughout church history. For the better part of, of Christian tradition, on Easter, when people were, were, were traditionally baptized, they would be asked three questions. Do you believe in God? And they would recite, yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived, and on and on and on it would go. But have you thought how strange, how even how weird that question is? In the in the inauguration of the Harvard Memorial Chapel lectures this year, uh, author and YouTuber and vlogger and all of the the many hats that he wears, uh, the author John Green was uh, was invited to give the memorial address, and he posed he posed that exact question. He said. We think that I believe is maybe the easiest statement in the world to say, but think about what we're saying when we say it. Who is I? Is I the the culmination of the neurons firing in my brain that form a consciousness? Is I the, so the summation of cells that make up my body where more than half of the cells that are currently in my possession are cells that have our bacteria and another single-celled organism that have colonized me. So more than half of the cells that make up me are not, in fact, me. In fact, what does it mean to say, I believe in God? Because I, I believe things about God. I believe things around God. But I believe in God is the confession. The challenge of belief is not so much that it asks too little of us, or is not, is the problem of faith is not that it asks too much of us, but often that it asks too little. Belief is supposed to challenge us. And one of the gifts of living in a secular world is that for the first time in written history, and for the first time in much of recorded history, belief is not assumed. If you talk to the average person walking down the street, if you go to Foodland after church today, most of the people that you talk to don't think twice about what they believe. They just go through life. They get up in the morning. They do what's important to them. They take care of the people that they need to take care of. They they do what they love, and they go to bed and wake up the next day and start it all again. We, who gather in this place, in this time, for this purpose, are weird in 2022. But that weirdness is special. And I want to make the argument today that this, this fruit of the Spirit, this fruit of faithfulness, is actually the key to unlocking all the other fruit. It, the, the, key of, the key of faithfulness is the key to unlocking all of the things in the life that you, in your relationship with God that you have wanted to have come from understanding the faithfulness, the fruit of faithfulness. Because our world doesn't get it. The world puts things into categories of of knowledge or belief. Knowledge that is king and facts where that are supposed to be assumed and, and appreciated equally by all people for all times into eternity. Knowledge is, is king, and knowledge is the throne at which human society is called to kneel. But knowledge isn't the sum total of everything, of course. There, are, there is knowledge, and then there are opinions. Opinions are where 
you can have a, a belief about something or or other, and when it be, at the moment it, be, it moves from being simply an opinion about or a pre, of a, a or a preference to being uh, to being organized, it's it moves into the realm of belief. Faith is then the codification of a system of beliefs. The problem with all of that is that. It starts with a premise that you can't prove. No one can prove to you or to me or to anyone that knowledge is king. At some point, the basic premise that we start with is an assumption. That if knowledge is king, that if what is known is, is shared equally among all people, then we can, we can start with a premise that says that prove that fact to me first. And then all the other things come, come out of it. We struggle to be a people of belief without being a people who stem into argumentation, who stem into fractalization, stem into all of the other pieces that, go, that are the negative side of belief. Our world organizes things in terms of faith and knowledge. And if you can't know it, then you can't share it. Because it's just yours and it's your opinion about the world, the universe, and everything in between. But our world operates on so much more faith than we realize. Open up your wallet, if you have one. I don't have one with me, but if you open up your wallet and take a look at the thing that you would use to exchange for services or for for goods or for, for products or for some other some other item in the world. And it is just a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper that's colored and, and artistically designed, sure, but it has no intrinsic value. It has no worth in and of itself, except the worth that we ascribe to it. You know, if I, if I, if I drive up next to you in my, in my car and I put a, a siren on the top of my car and I, I start, start flashing when you... When, you know, will you pull over because if you recognize that it's me? If I, if I walk up to you at the, end of, at the end of the service and say, Don, you're under arrest. My words carry no weight, no value. But if somebody walks in off the street wearing their uniform, with their badge, duly deputized in authority, and say exactly the same word, words, Don responds differently. Hopefully. <laughs> the, the reality is that so many parts of our life, so many of the things that we do every single day hinge on the basis not of knowledge or fact, but on belief. Our world runs on belief. The fa- simple fact that we make plans more than a minute or two in advance is proof that we are wired to operate on faith. We have no guarantee that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. We believe it based on other, uh, other evidence, but at, this, at, at some point, we have zero proof that tomorrow will exist. And yet we plan, we make we, we, we organize ourselves, we arrange ourselves according to a pattern of hope. This is a world that runs on faith. The, faith isn't, faith isn't the, the, the counterpoint of, of what the church does. You can't, the, faith isn't the, the, the output of the church. Faith is what lets the, the church even exist. There would be no church if we weren't inherently people who are wired to be faithful. Nothing we do here could happen. Nothing could be planned or organized or intended. Nothing could be arranged or, or put together or, or brought to life without recognizing that we, the world runs on faith. Nothing else is ever going to happen. And this is part of the problem with the modern world. The modern world has lost its, its most basic understanding 
of faith and its role in the world. You hear often the news will lament the, the, the decay of institutions and organizations in the world, where we, we who talk about faith on a more regular basis understand that when you take the, the faith component out of everyday ordinary life, all of the other things that, it's, that are built on that same foundation begin to crumble. It's no wonder that we can't interact with with organizations and with institutions anymore because we don't have a foundation to talk about things that are eternal. Everything that we that we talk about that's that's human human made is finite by definition. But if there are things that are supposed to last, then there needs to be an eternal quality and we need to reinvent and reinvigorate our world with the language of faithfulness or nothing is going to get better. And so this is why I think that this is actually the hope of, of our world. Because there's a crisis of faithful, faithlessness in our world. We see it all the time. We see it when politicians are caught lying. We see it when pastors are, are caught in immoral situations. We see it when people steal from charities. We see it when people are fraudulent, when they're supposed to be trusted. The reality of faith as it's talked about in Scripture is not, uh, is not uh, and sort of this idea that exists in our head of, of ideas about God. It is the, the, the language of faith, faithfully believing and persisting in trust. Faithfully persisting in trust is the, de- is the biblical definition of faithfulness. It's not about ideas. It's not about philosophy. It's not about knowing, the, knowing right from wrong. Faith and faithfulness, belief, is at its core about being trusted and trusting the one who has put us here. And trust is always driven by character. When we as a people who are called to be faithful look for God in our interactions, look for God in our world, look for God in the commonplace, we get the opportunity to see him keep showing up again and again and again. And that faithful character of God leads us down a road where we find ourselves in situations where we increasingly have to build trust in God. To be a faithful people we are called to be a trustworthy people. To be a people that can be trusted in any and every area of life that we are called into. The fruit of faithfulness is a fruit of trust. Does the world trust you to be the people that you say you're going to be? Does the world trust you to be the people that you want to be? Does the world trust you to Go out the doors on Sunday, Sunday afternoon and live as though what you've, what you've worshipped and what you've sang is true in every moment thereafter. Are you trustworthy is the question that the fruit of faithfulness begs. Because God is trustworthy is the message that Paul, Paul writes to Timothy. God has always been there for Timothy, for Paul, when Paul needed it. When, when times were good, God was there. When times were hard, God was there. And the single message at the, at the end of his life, when all else has been stripped away, that Paul wants Timothy to understand is that whatever Timothy is going to go through, good times, bad times, dry times, wet times, anything else in between those times God is going to keep showing up. And so the question that Timothy has to answer is, will he? Will Timothy show up day after day? Will Timothy put on his boots and his coat and keep pressing forward? Because the world isn't going to do it for us anymore. There was a time where the world would make the, the, the Christian way the easiest way possible. Where the world and, the, and where governments would, would, could legislate denominations into existence. The Presbyterian Church in Canada exists today by an act of parliament. 
the Presbyterian Church in Canada got the best plots of land as new cities were incorporated across the country in the 20th century. When cities were incorporated, it was, the question was always put to city planners, where will the churches be? Today, that's not the question that's being asked of us. The, the, the way is not being made easy anymore. But the question for us is still the same one that Paul asks to Timothy. Will you continue to be faithful? Will you continue to show up for the things that need your attention? Will you continue to show up in the ways that God is calling you forward? Because the crisis and the opportunity in this moment are huge. If we can be a people who can demonstrate that faithfulness has real, tangible, practical benefits for us and for our world, then we can showcase the, sheer, the, the weakness and the hollowness and the emptiness of a secular worldview. It doesn't come by being right or by having the best arguments for the existence of God. It comes from being a people who demonstrate faithfulness in a world that is faithless. So how do we do this? Imposter syndrome is a real thing. Maybe you've been in a situation where you've been, you felt like you're in over your head. Where you feel, felt like this is going to be the moment where they realize that I've been faking my way through this up to this point. I've, I've been there. I'm there most of the time if I'm, if, I'm really, if I'm really honest. Every single time virtually that I stand up here to preach, I'm going to, I, I, I feel, this, I feel the, 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 the terror of, of, the, of, is this going to be the moment where I open my mouth to speak and nothing comes out? where I have nothing to say to the gathered people of God. The reality, though, of, of it is that through careful work and preparation, that when you feel like an imposter, lean into it. Lean into the impossibility of what you are being asked to do. When you feel like you are overwhelmed, when you feel like you are in over your head, when you feel like you simply cannot do what is being asked of you in the, in the moment, lean in. You may not need to take the entire step at once, but if you can shuffle your feet forward even just a little bit further and keep going, when, you, when it feels like everything is stacked against you, lean into it. Because over time, God's faithfulness will keep showing up in your life. God's faithfulness keeps showing up in my life. I find myself in, in situations all the time where I have no idea how I'm going to survive the week ahead. I have no idea how I'm going to find more hours in the day. I have no idea how I'm going to make ends meet. Inflation keeps going up. Prices for everything go up. The challenge of being the church keeps going up. And God's faithfulness has been there for me every step of the way. And so the reality of God's faithfulness is that it's simply an invitation to say, okay, God has not let me down to this point. For six months, my family survived in Niagara Falls on a single income with house prices skyrocketing because, not because we had, we knew how we were going to pay the bills, but because God kept taking care of us. God kept showing up. God kept making sure everything that we needed, we had. God's faithfulness over and over and over again became a litany that, that Beth and I would tell each other. After a year of being here in Niagara, we have so many stories of God's faithfulness over 
and over and over again. And so every challenge that we, that we find ourselves in, every new hurdle, every time I ask, how am I possibly going to get through this week? The, the question stops being about how am I going to do this and about where is God going to show up in my week? I'm learning day by day, and I'm not perfect at this. This is one of the hardest ones for me, but I'm learning day after day after day that my job is not to have the answers, but to lean into the questions, to believe that God is, has been there for me in the hard times, and God will be there for me in the good times, and God will be there for me in the next set of hard times. Faithfulness is about leaning in. Leaning in not to the, the person that you are, but leaning into the person that you want to become. That's why this is the key to all of the other ones. If you want to become a more patient person, lean in to patience. Find, find, a, find a patient person in your head, in your, in your imagination, and act like that person for one moment. And then act like that person for one moment more. And then act like that person for one moment more. And gradually, the minutes and the moments add up, and you look back on your life and say, I am a more patient person today than I was a year ago. I am a more gentle person today than I was a lifetime ago. I am a more thoughtful person today than I was yesterday. Faithfulness becomes a habit of building faithful habits and lets us become the person that you, that you always knew was possible. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, for as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.